Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Leia with Headwater Science Institute, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the student presentation evening for our spring research program. Really happy to present the students and their hard work to you tonight. You're also going to get to meet their mentors. And before we jump off into their presentations, I just want to let you know that this is a great way to understand what our summer research program is going to look like. So if you're watching this along with your child or if you're a teacher and you like what you see, head over to our website. We've got two great summer research programs that we're accepting registration for right now. So let's get into the research. First off, I am super excited to introduce mentor Mia Goldman. Hi, Mia. How are you? Good. Thanks. Um, so I'm a graduate student at uh, the University of Nevada, Reno, and I currently study population dynamics in American PICA. Um, and I am very pleased to introduce um, my first student of the evening, um, Le Leo. <laughs> um, sorry. Thanks, Mia. That's great. Do we want to have Leo bring up his screen share and get into his presentation? Leo, do you want to go ahead and share your screen for us? Looks like we may be having some technical difficulties here. Okay. Um, I shared it. Can you guys see it? Um, not yet. Perfect. There we go. All right, Leo, you're off and away. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Leo Long. I'm a high schooler from Chuck. Yeah, and my experiment today is based on I smell in Sharky, California. So um, my experiment is comparing the effects of NACL based DS melts versus CACL melts. So NACL stands for sodium chloride and CACL is calcium chloride. Um, I hypothesize that when the isol main ingredient is sodium chloride, the effects will be larger on increasing parts per million, pH, and conductivity, as opposed to calcium chloride mixtures. On the left, you can see the snowplow, which is the calcium chloride, and on the right of the picture is the time crystal, the sodium chloride. Um, over 13,719 gallons of isol melt have been dumped onto Chucky Towers roads every winter to clear the ice off of them. This ice salt eventually affects aquatic ecosystems drastically by changing the toxicity and increasing salinity in the water, which can cause microvertebrates to migrate and will heavily damage the ecosystem. So my question is based on determining the effects of calcium chloride versus sodium chloride ice salts by doing tests on pH conductivity in parts per million. Um, so when the isolate main ingredient is sodium chloride, I predict the effects will be larger on increasing parts per million, pH, and conductivity as opposed to calcium and water waste mixtures. Um, is everything going well in the technology? Hey, Leo, I'm so sorry to stop you, but we're getting a lot of kind of breaking up of your talking. I wonder if it might be your headset, your um, AirPods. Do you want to try maybe disconnecting and just using your computer audio? All right. Um, is this any better? Perfect. That's much, much better. Leo, let's just go ahead and reset. Great. Let's go back to your first slide and we'll just do take two. It's the year of technology. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I wasn't quite ready to go first. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back. Okay, so once again, my name is Leo Long. I'm a high schooler from Truckee High, and my experiment is on ice melt in Truckee, California. So um, my experiment is comparing the effects of NACL-based de-icing melts versus CACL melts. So for those of you who don't know, NACL stands for 
calcium chloride, and CaCl stands for calcium chloride. So on the image to the left, on the left, you can see um, snowplow, which is the calcium chloride, and diamond crystal, which is the sodium chloride. I hypothesize when the isolate melt main ingredient is sodium chloride, the effects will be larger on increasing parts per million pH and conductivity as opposed to the calcium mixture. Over 13,719 gallons of isolate melt are dumped onto Truckee Dawes roads every winter to clear the ice off of them. This isolate eventually makes its way into the aquatic ecosystems and drastically changes the toxicity by increasing salinity in the water and causing macroinvertebrates to migrate, migrate, which can heavily damage the ecosystem. So my question is specifically based on determining the effects of calcium chloride versus sodium chloride isolates by conducting tests on water pH, conductivity, and parts per million. Uh, the reason I chose to stop was because the two most popular brands in my town happened to be um, using two different main ingredients, and I wanted to give a suggestion to the public over which one is healthier for the environment. So the independent variable is the isolate melt, and the dependent variable is the parts per million pH and conductivity. Okay, so um, the methods that I use, so first I collected a total of 40 samples of one cup of tap water. I then tested the original parts per million pH and conductivity and added in, um, so that was before I added in the salt, and then I added in either 100 milligrams or 300 milligrams of the salt, and I stirred it and let it sit for five minutes before testing the new parts per million pH and conductivity. I then proceeded to analyze and record the results on Google spreadsheets. So my materials were snowplow ice melt, diamond crystal ice melt, Easy Strips pH tester, and the hand and instruments pH tester. Here's a picture of me actually conducting the experiment in my house. Um, and here's a picture of all the materials I used. So after analyzing all my data, two main patterns were exposed. When the ice salt was at 300 milligrams, the p-value um, comparing the two brands was below 0 0.05, which showed a high variation between brands. Um, my hypothesis was correct on the idea of the two brands changing, um, changing water parts million and conductivity, but it turns out that I was wrong and it did not change pH. Uh, the mean was consistently higher in NaCl, so the sodium chloride brand for both parts per million and conductivity, and it turns out that the sodium chloride brand is much more popular because it only costs 10 to $20 as opposed to the Calcium chloride costing twenty to forty dollars. So here's my first graph, um, and this basically just shows the original data before I put in the different isolates. In red is the pH, yellow is the conductivity, and blue is parts per million. Um, and this is kind of like the basis that I used in them. Here, here is when I start putting in the isolate. So graph two shows the parts per million with one hundred milligrams of ice. So, um, blue is the original parts per million um, before I put in the ice salt, and then red is the calcium. Hey, Leo. Leo, Leo, can I have you pause for just a sec? I'm really yeah. sorry, but your internet is doing something strange, um, and I'd love to have people understand what you researched. Do you think, could we maybe have Mia come in and talk a little bit about um, your research as you kind of go through the slides, just so that we don't lose all the audio? Yeah, yeah, sorry, my internet's not working great. That's okay, no problem at all. Mia, do you think you could kind of help talk us through it? Sure, um, should we review just a little bit, um, going back just a step, okay. And Leo, yeah. it sounded better for a second, but we'll just we'll just play with it and see what happens. And team, make this a team effort. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, the important point just to know going forward, I think, is that Leo um, is very interested in how a salt melt can affect aquatic ecosystems. Um, he looked at varying levels of intensity of uh, two brands of ice salt melt um, as it affects pH, conductivity, and parts per million. So I'm, and 
And in terms of your results, Leo, if you want to try to say those again, we can we can see if your internet's better, and then I can jump in if you need. Okay. Um, I'll just talk really slow. Um, so after analyzing all of my data, I had two patterns. When the ice salt was at 300 milligrams, the p-value compared to the snowplow and guy and crystal brain for approximately connectivity below 0 0.05. All right, energy. Leo, it's it's not working. So let me go through what you just said. Um, <laughs> So he did not find a, a significant difference um, across the mean pHs. He did across parts per million and um, conductivity uh, between the two brands. And as he said, this is a graph showing the three, um, three states he has, uh, you know, his control. Um, oh, these are all the controls. And this is the comparison between the 100 milligrams of salt and 300 milligrams of ice of salt. Um, and I feel like we're doing a miming exercise, Leo, or something like this. <laughs> and he has listed the results for each of the brands, um, minimum, maximum, average across these graphs. Is there anything else you want to try to add here, Leo? Um. Brand one is calcium chloride, and brand two is sodium chloride. I don't know if that went through, but... Yes. Crystal clear. Should we go to the... Anything else to say about here? Do you want to... Brand two conductivity was, was much higher, right? You found? Yes. The 300 milligrams of ice salt. So since it worked, why don't you go ahead and start and I'll interrupt you if um, it goes out on the next slide. Okay, yeah, so um, at 100 milligrams in the parts per million test, P was more than 0 0.05, kind of like Mia said, showing that there was not a significant difference between the two groups. And then in the table below, you can see the differences in parts per million between groups at 100 milligrams. Um, you can see that the mean for the ca calcium chloride is higher in the, um, is it still working fine? You're good. Okay. So the mean is higher in the calcium chloride for 100 milligrams. And then when you see it at 300 milligrams, the p-value um, is less than 0 0.05, showing a significant difference. And... At 300 milligrams, the sodium chloride has a higher mean. That's basically a summary of it. And then, so de-icing um, melt will always be a necessity because as long as there's snow, it will have a need. And so eliminating it is not an option. And with the addition of climate change, there's um, more, it's affecting snowfall levels, causing more snow to come down, which means more ice salt has to be used. So um, the idea that I came up with um, was to implement a de-icing ice melt pickup crew to come up after the crew that lays down the ice salt um, and then sweep it all up to mitigate however much actually goes into the stream through runoff. And this will heavily reduce the effects that it can have on the aquatic ecosystems. And this system is actually being used here in Chucky uh, as I'm speaking, and it is working tremendously well. So road salts with sodium chloride as the main ingredient have a larger effect on water parts per million and conductivity than calcium chloride salts. Um, changing the parts per million and conductivity in aquatic ecosystem, as I said earlier, it can cause macroinvertebrates to migrate and damage the ecosystem. And additionally, this road salt can also, is very bad for dogs because um, it, it causes discomfort when it gets in their pads and leads to ingestion, which eventually can lead to death. So in the future, I suggest that we look more into an excess ice smelt pickup crew after the um, crew that lays it down to help mitigate these effects. 
Um, we should also monitor stream chemical levels across regions where there's a lot of snowfall. Um, we should monitor soil health as the soil can eventually make its way into streams and cause the same problems as the runoff. And then more towards the experiment, we could use more types of salt. We could use another level of intensity. We could compare east to west and measure turbidity as part of the experiment. Um, I would like to acknowledge Keenan Sito, Mia Goldman, Spencer Eudson, Drew Jack, Daniel Ludick, Megan Seifert, and Sarah Shropshire for all helping me with my project. Um, I know n not everything worked out perfectly with internet, um, but feel free to ask me questions. Thank you, and here are my references. Great job powering through that, Leo. There's always some technology to work out. and. Um, as the questions come in, I just want to um, do this little backwards and introduce you, which we didn't get to do uh, earlier. Um, and you said, as you said, you're a high schooler from Truckee, but I think it's important to note, um, Leo's hobbies include playing sports, hanging with friends and eating food. And when he grows up, he wants to be either a scientist or a doctor because he loves to help people. And his favorite sport is soccer. And his favorite part of science, science is mineralogy. Um, and he lives in Truckee, Tahoe, as you know, and so he really chose an experiment close to his heart with an impact on his local community, which I think is totally cool. Um, do I have any questions? Not yet that I can see. So in the meantime, I'll ask you a question. Um, Leo, how did you decide which, um, how did you decide how much intensity um, to test in terms of uh, ice salt melt levels? So I kind of did a couple of preliminary tests um, and then I eventually decided that those were two pretty good ranges because um, not only is did just when I measured it out, it was about like one little grain of the ice salt was 100 milligrams and about two or three was 300. So that was a good measurement. And um, when I did the preliminary experiments, those two seemed to be like the best two variations of it. Okay, question just came in. Um, Brian asks, are there effective de-icing solutions like sand that can be used that are not chemical based? There are actually three that come to my mind right now. Um, there's sand, coffee beans, and beet juice. Um, all the three, like they work in their own ways, like the beet juice, um, it melts down the ice, but then consequently it makes the sidewalk slippery, which kind of defeats a little bit of the purpose. And then like sand, you know, like it will break it down, but it's, it's um, kind of more expensive to just buy that much sand. And then coffee beans, it's kind of a weird resource, so. Okay, next question. What other kinds of ice removal exist in other cold places? And do you have any idea how damaging those are ecologically? Yeah, so like, um, I also started looking into some magnesium chloride mixtures. Um, and those, like based on the reports that I read, I didn't conduct an experiment on it but it was kind of giving the gist that the magnesium chloride was bad for the environment, um, probably either the same or worse than the sodium chloride, but it seemed like the calcium chloride ended up being the best. Um, so in general, all of them are pretty damaging. It's kind of just a choice of which one is worth or worse. One more comment. Great job, Leo. Such an important issue that needs to be solved in areas with lots of snow like Trekkie. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah. Keep at it, Leo. There's lots of future research to do there. Mm -hmm. All right. If that's it, I think that concludes your presentation. And again, great job powering through um, the technical difficulties. And we will bring in uh, the next student. Um, my next mentee uh, is Daniel. So Daniel, come on up. Okay. Um, can you hear me? 
Yes, let me introduce you first real quick now. <laughs> so um, second student I've been mentoring is Daniel Bonilla. He is currently a high school student um, at Dr. Richard A. Vladovic Harbor Teacher Preparation Academy in Wilmington, California. Um, Daniel is passionate in environmental justice and advocating for environmental racism awareness. In the fall, Daniel will be an engineering student and is excited to explore both biomedical and environmental engineering. So with that, go ahead and take it away, Daniel. Um, so like Mia said, my name is Daniel and um, the gist of my project is basically an air pollution analysis in relation to asthma in California. So um, for the brief introduction, so first, what is air pollution? So air pollution is when there are pollutants in the air that is breathed by all living organisms, so humans, animals, um, and everything in between. Um, so specifically air pollution in California. So there are 58 counties in California and uh, being from Southern California, being from LA County, um, I have always presumed that we've had some of the worst air quality um, and in relation to that, maybe higher cases of asthma. And as a result of that is um, all the refineries, the ports and very industrialized communities. Um, for instance, my high school is a block away from an oil refinery. So I often question how safe is the air we breathe and um, is there something we should know a little bit more? Um, so another thing to add is what does it mean to have bad air? So when I say that it has bad air quality, um, I'm using a lot of data from the air quality index, the AQI. So that is a good summary of particulate matter, which are small particles in the air, um, carbon dioxide and ozone from different car emissions and um, industrial plants as well. Um, and of course, what are the consequences of the bad air quality? So that's why I wanted to connect it to asthma so asthma affects a lot of people, a lot of children, um, especially in my community. So I wanted to look um, as well into the asthma rates of hospitalization. So that's when people went to the hospital for asthma related issues. Um, and then I wanted to see the trends that um, followed this. So initially I theorized that um, based on the household income, um, those communities would have higher cases of asthma as a result of bad air quality. So um, I'll get into that a little bit later, but um, a lot of the data that we're looking at has been from 2015 to 2018. And uh, we kind of chunked out California for both, for, I'm sorry, for all three, Southern, Central, and Northern. Um, so my research question is, what are the anthropogenic divers and mechanisms of poor air quality across California counties in relation to asthma hospitalizations? So my independent variable for this are the different counties in California. Like I said, there are 58. Um, and then the dependent variable, which is what is being um, accounted for is the rates of asthma hospitalizations, the average household income, and the AQI or air quality index per county. So um, my hypothesis is Southern California counties will have higher rates of asthma hospitalizations and have a higher AQI, meaning that there's lower overall air quality as a result of the low income communities that dwell in the Southern region. So in particular, LA County will have higher amounts of asthma hospitalizations. So um, for materials and methods, um, a lot of the data sets that I got were from pre-existing um, sets online, which was pretty good that I didn't have to go to every single county in California and um, have like meters and stuff to collect the air quality data. Um, so the data for the air quality index report, which included, um, you know, particulate matter, ozone and carbon emissions, um, that was all from the EPA. So I put a little screenshot there. Um, all the average household income information was pulled from Index Monday. Um, from the years 2014 to 2018. Um, I used the California census to help divide up the different regions of California, so Northern, Central, and Southern, and then I made that into an Excel sheet. And then the data for the asthma hospitalizations were also found online um, for the specific years 2015 to 2018. And um, yeah. 
So this is kind of going into like my results and what I was able to find through the data. But um, here's the first graph on the left is the average household income across California counties. So you see that through the counties there are varied incomes. Um, for instance, Santa Clara County has the highest um, average income for the county. Um, but then if you look at Trinity County, which is near the end, has one of the lowest. Um, some counties I could not find the average, so that's why they are missing. Um, and then the graph on the right, which is the one in blue, it's the mean asthma hospitalizations by California County. So this is the number of asthma asthma induced hospitalizations um, from 2015 to 2018. And you can see that Los Angeles County has by far the most um, hospitalizations and some of the other counties are very small. So um, with all the data and um, all of the CSV files we're able to make with all the um, information, we're able to run a few um, statistical analyses. And um, the first data figure on the left is the average air quality across regions. So we are looking at the central, northern, and southern regions of California. And um, for the AQI, the air quality index, um, an AQI under 50 means that you have good air. Um, an AQI between 50 and 100 is moderate air. So people with pre-existing um, conditions or they have problems breathing um, should be a little more advised. And anything over 100 is considered bad air um, and a higher risk um, for more illnesses. So you can see that, for instance, Central and Northern California have um, about 50 and a little less for their air quality. Um, this shows that they have a moderate uh, mix of both healthy air quality and um, within with moderation. Um, but if you look at Southern California, you will see that they have very poor air quality. Um, it's kind of going between 50 and 75, 80. Uh, which is something to take note of. And then if you look at the graph on the right, it's the mean asthma visit rate by region. So um, the purple area shows like the parameters of the average amount of visits and the dots are showing some of the specific counties um, for both central, northern and southern. So in particular, if you take a look at the top right quadrant of southern, if you go up, there is a dot there. So um, for almost, I think it was about 16,000 cases um, were just a result of Los Angeles County. So um, kind of continuing with the results, um, we wanted to initially see if there was any connection between the average household income in relation to the hospitalizations and the poor air quality, but we could not find enough substantial um, information. Uh, when we ran the p-values, um, we found that both asthma hospitalizations by region and air quality by region were significant, but it was not substantial enough for household income. Um, and I think kind of going into maybe reasons why um, there may have been issues or if this test is to be run again, uh, we were trying to get familiar with R, which is a coding software. So it was very new to me and um, it was a little difficult trying to get um, Zoom to work and share screen, so I had a little bit of difficulties with that. So um, if I ever redid the experiment, I'd like to get a little more familiar with the platform. Um, another thing to take into consideration is that these data sets that I was using um, are about three to six years old. So even though 2015 and 2018 and every the years between don't seem that far away, um, it has been quite a while since um, that exact amount of data has been looked into. Um, and the reason I had to look into those years is a lot of the more recent data, so anything after 2019 or 2020 was not available yet. And um, I inserted a picture of the California population estimate by county. So um, if you look and you see Los Angeles County, which is pretty red, um, but then you can look at Trinity County, which is more of a beige, and that's in the Northern California region. Um, Trinity County has about 12,000 residents, while California, or, well, I'm sorry, while Los Angeles County has about 10 million residents. So um, if we go back, we can see that Southern California 
um, since Los Angeles County had such a high amount of visits to the hospital, um, they had more people visiting than the entire population of that one California County, Trinity County. So um, I think it'd be really important to take that into consideration that the populations vary from each county, um, that they may not be an accurate estimation based off of um, population taken into consideration. And um, for, future, for future research, um, I think it'd be really important to kind of dive into a little more of the specifics. So what exact components are contributing to poor air quality and the exact amounts and measurements of each. Um, personally, a lot of oil refineries and industrial plants, especially in Wilmington, California, Carson, California, and some areas of Torrance um, are very close to houses and schools and community centers. So I think it's really important to maybe do a little more research on the exact impacts that those refineries are having on those um, households. And I made a little graph that was showing how many oil refineries are in Southern, Northern, and Central California. Um, so Southern California has about 46% of all of their um, oil refineries out of California. So 15 oil refineries are in California. Seven of them are in Los Angeles County and four out of seven are in the cities within a close proximity. So this includes Wilmington, Torrance, and Carson. And there's a few um, in Wilmington as well as Carson. So I think it's really important to maybe look at that at a smaller scale, maybe going in depth with just, Cal with just Los Angeles County um, and seeing all the subdivisions of those individual cities in relation to the average household income that might get more varied results. But um, that's my work cited. And then questions. Okay, awesome job, Daniel. We'll wait for some questions to come in. Um, let's see. In the meantime, I'll ask you a question. Um, uh, so what were you most surprised by in your results? Um, I think the most surprising thing was because initially I kind of wanted to look into the um, average household income and see if it had any contrib contribution to, you know, poor air quality and the um, asthma hospitalizations. So I think finding initially that there weren't any um, imperative uh, data that proved that it was a big contribution was kind of surprising. Um, and I think being able to get a little more in depth and focus like in specific cities or specific counties in California, I might be able to see that connection a little better because for instance, Los Angeles County has like Wilmington, California, which is a really low income community, but then Beverly Hills, which is very high. So it's not that balanced. Yes, more statistics to be learned for sure about how to scale data. Um, okay, Michael has a question. While researching, did you come across other potential factors such as forest fires or weather patterns that could have contributed to drastic changes in air quality? So thank you, Michael, for your question. Um, so that is one thing we definitely tried to take into consideration. Um, so I think that because the years were 2015 to 2018, we weren't able to go exactly into how recent like our big California fires are. Um, so that is definitely something that um, causes poor air quality, especially in Northern California and sometimes in the central area. Um, so that's definitely something that I would have to look into a little more, but um, it definitely causes poor air quality as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel. Fantastic presentation. And I think that wraps it up. So we're going to bring on Michael now to go ahead and introduce his student. Michael, thank you so much for being here and for mentoring. And I'll let you go ahead and unmute and take it away. Thank you, Leah. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Michael. I have a background in biology and sustainable communities, and my research interests include plant evolution and environmental changes on stressors in aquatic ecosystems. 
And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the amazing Ellie, who is currently a student attending Benicia High School, and she will be presenting her topic on the effect of salinity and nutrients on the growth of algae at the Point Reyes National Seashore. So hello, my name is Ali and my mentor is Michael and my project title is, what are the effects of salinity and nutrients on the growth of algae at the Point Reyes National Seashore? So starting off with an introduction, an algae bloom is a rapid increase or an accumulation in the population of algae in either freshwater or marine water systems. And it's often recognized by the discoloration in the water from their pigments. Algae, requ algae requires factors such as warm temperatures, sunlight and nutrients to grow and reproduce. So they, they accumulate in the upper 60 to 90 meters of ocean water. And in two, um, 2018, there were more than 300 reported incidents of toxic or harmful algae blooms around the globe. And so algae blooms have been on the rise globally for the past 30 year, for the past 30 years, presumably because of warmer water temperatures uh, due to climate change and nitrogen and phosphate phosphoric nutrient runoff. And so while less than one percent of algal blooms produce hazardous toxins, toxins, these harmful algal blooms have negative effects for both bodies of freshwater and marine water producing extremely dangerous toxins that can sicken or kill people and animals, creating dead zones in the water and even raising treatment costs for drinking water. And even non-toxic blooms can hurt the environment and local economies by causing conditions where oxygen is depleted from the water, um, blocks sunlight um, from, from organisms located in deeper waters and clog or harm fish gills. So my research question was, how do the various salinity and nutrient levels affect the growth rate of algae at the Point Reyes National Seashore? And so I hypothesized that water samples with a high level of nutrients and normal levels of salinity would have the highest turbidity level. And my independent variables were the various nutrient and salinity treatment levels. And the dependent variable was the turbidity as an indicator of algal growth. So the materials I used in my project was the API Pond Master Kit, a Pasco turbidity meter, 36 sample cups, and a TDS meter. So I first started off by collecting a total of 36 marine water samples at the Point Reyes National Seashore. So I collected 18 cups at Tomales Bay and 18 cups at Limitor Beach. And I applied six different treatments to the cups ranging in different levels of salinity and nutrients. And once all the samples underwent treatment, temperature, nitrate, phosphate, ammonia, and total dissolved, solvent, total dissolved solids and turbidity were measured immediately after treatment and on days two and four. And each sample cup was shaken multiple times throughout the data collection to stimulate the moving waters of the site environment the samples were originally taken in. So here are some of my data figures. So the slide shows two line graphs that show the change in turbidity over time at the two sites I collected data at. And as you can see in both graphs, treatment two at both sites had the highest rate in the change of turbidity. And treatment two was a low salinity treatment with one teaspoon of nutrient solution added. And then additionally, the lowest change in turbidity for both sites was treatment five, which was a high salinity treatment with no nutrient solution added. So on this slide, it shows the statistical analysis test that I ran. So I used RStudio to determine the correlation between salinity and nutrients on turbidity. And using the one-way ANOVA test, the effect of salinity on turbidity at site one was statistically significant with a p-value of 0.03 and extremely significant at site two with a p-value of 0 0.0007. And additionally, I used a two-way ANOVA test to determine the significance of the interaction effect of salinity and nutrients on turbidity. And my tests were shown to be statistically significant at both sites. 
Site 1 had a p-value of 0.004, and Site 2 had a p-value of 0.0016. So my experiment demonstrates that an increase in nutrients and a decrease in salinity led to the highest growth rate in algae at Limitor Beach and Tamales Bay, the two sites that I collected data at. And so based on the results of the two-way NOVA, the findings um, show that high nutrient levels and low salinity led to the largest growth in algae at both sites. And the findings presented in the study support my hypothesis, which was that water samples from both sites with a low salinity level and nutrients would have the highest increase in turbidity over the course of the experiment. And then this is likely due to the fact that salinity causes osomic pressure in and outside of plant and animal cells, causing them to swell. And um, these conditions put constraint on the growth of species, such as the algae types that were presented at each site. And so additionally, variations in salinity also influence several biochemical and physiological mechanisms, such as lipid production and growth, which is essential in marine organisms. And so further research could include sampling more sites at the Point Reyes National Seashore, testing more parameters, such as different types of nutrients and a wider range of salinity or nutrient levels. We could also um, possibly test like different types of algae species in comparison to each other. And the experiment should be repeated at different sites in Northern California, such as in Santa Cruz or Monterey Bay, to see if the see if the results would remain the same within the data collected in my experiment. So here's my work cited. So thank you everyone for watching my presentation. And thank you, Ali, for your awesome talk. And now we're going to move on to any questions that anybody might have. If there are no questions, I can start off with one. Um, so if you repeat the experiment at more research sites, do you think that you would find the same results? Um, I feel like a big part of it depends on like what algae species are present. I wasn't able to, in my experiment, look into the different types of algae species um, that I um, manipulated like the treatments with. Um, so I'm not completely sure, but that's something that I would definitely want to research in the future. Uh, awesome. And someone, um, Willow, is asking, do any of your are any of your results surprising to you? So particularly for treatment five, it was a high salinity treatment with no added nutrients. I was really surprised because the um, the algae did not grow in the treatment cups um, for the treatment five, and I was just really surprised that the turbidity remained constantly at zero for all of the um, sample replicates. Awesome. And um, one last question. Do you expect any changes in the results if the experiment was conducted over a longer time period? Yeah, so I originally corrected, I collected data on day zero, two, and four. And it turned out that the turbidity level from days two to four jumped for a lot of the um, treatments. And so I think um, by collecting data over a longer period of time, maybe like two weeks or like a month, um, would be a good idea for further research. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Michael. We're going to bring on Carrie now. And Carrie, I'll let you go ahead and take it away and introduce your next student. Oh, Carrie, you're muted. Thank you, Leah. 
All right, I am Carrie Spooler. Um, I'm an environmental scientist and I have a master's in geoscience from Boise State University. Um, I was lucky enough to mentor the next three students that we're gonna hear from tonight. Uh, the first one will be Vivian Scott from Aragon High School in San Mateo. Um, I really like Vivian's project because it was a really great um, backyard study investigating something that she sees every day, which in this case is the different microclimates across San Francisco and um, studying how these different um, climates might affect things in the environment like soil quality. Um, she's a really great field scientist. She collected a ton of data um, for her project, even more than she's gonna have time to show you tonight. And she also did a really great job taking really detailed field notes and observations. So you can get started. Thank you so much. Um, so as Carrie said, my name is Vivian Scott. I go to Aragon High School, and today I'm going to be talking about how San Francisco's microclimates affect soil quality. Um, so microclimates are small regions within the same larger climate area um, that contain very drastically different climate conditions. Um, so even just um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, in the city of San Francisco, microclimates are extremely, extremely prevalent, even just between neighborhoods. So growing up in the Bay Area, um, I realized how it could be foggy in one part of San Francisco, but extremely sunny in another part of San Francisco, and was pretty interested in this kind of phenomenon. Um, and so soil quality is very, very influenced by climate, very tied to climate. Um, and so I really wanted to explore how and if microclimates affected soil quality. Um, so my research question, I was really interested in how soil quality differed between microclimates in the city of San Francisco, specifically exploring urban parks. Um, so my independent variable was um, essentially differing microclimates um, between neighborhoods and I measured soil quality based on um, pH and soil nutrients, um, including nitrogen, potash, and phosphate levels. And I also measured um, moisture levels and soil texture. So I hypothesized that soil in the coldest and most rainy microclimates would contain the worst soil quality, um, kind of with the depletion of nutrients because um, I believe that rain and wind would cause nutrients to um, to become disturbed and essentially leach out of the soil um, without letting time for the, um, the nutrients to build up um, and develop. Um, so for my research, I wanted to test at least three different microclimates. So I selected ones that I knew had pretty drastic differences between them. Um, so I first chose um, a location based on a pre-existing climate that I was very, very aware of. Um, in the Mission Petrero area called Mariposa Park. Um, so the Mission District is pretty populated, pretty crowded, and um, is one of the sunnier and more warmer areas of San Francisco. And then I selected one microclimate with a pretty medium area. Um, so the climate is a bit colder than Mariposa Park, and that was in Twin Peaks called Tank Hill Park. And then I selected one more colder, more foggy region um, in Golden Gate Park. And so I tested um, some data from all three of these sites. Um, so for my methods, I visited parks in each of the areas that I just described. And I used a quadra, which is essentially two pieces of paper tied together. Um, and I threw it behind me to randomize um, the locations that I picked and to kind of eliminate any bias I had in choosing my replicates. Um, so I found 10 random replicate locations at each site, and I used a pH meter to collect pH and moisture data for each replicate I took. And then I also took six samples of soil at each location um, to test with an at-home soil rapid test. So once I was home, I used the instructions in the rapid test to mix the samples with water, and I used the solution to determine the phosphorus nitrogen and potassium concentrations in each sample. I then inputted all my data into Google Sheets to create bar graphs containing the results and run statistical analyses on each of my results. 
Um, so now I'll show you some of my key results. This graph shows the average levels of nutrients um, that I measured for each of my sites. Um, so the axis shows nutrient levels on a scale of zero to four. So zero being kind of depleted for having a surplus of nutrients and the green bar highlights the ideal range of nutrients. Um, so I measured three nutrients as you can see um, and at Golden Gate Park, I found that um, I found that the nutrient levels were all pretty even around the two range being um, the ideal range. Um, I found that at Tank Hill Park in Twin Peaks, the potash and nitrogen levels were in an extreme surplus. And at Mariposa Park, they were almost completely depleted. Um, and I found that phosphorus levels at Tank Hill Park were a bit deficient and at Mariposa Park were in the sufficient range, um, a bit on the higher end. Um, my p-values for all of these showed significant differences in the statistical analyses. Um, I also measured pH levels at each of the parks. Um, so this graph shows the average pH of the soil samples. So as you can see on the x-axis, um, each bar again represents a park, um, one of my locations. And then on the y-axis shows the pH. So pH is measured on a scale of 0 to 14. And as you can see, um, all of my, all of my um, soil samples were pretty neutral, although Golden Gate Park and Tank Hill Park um, leaned a little bit more basic and Mariposa Park leaned a bit more um, acidic. Um, so I also measured moisture levels between each location. Um, and the moisture levels were significantly different between the three sites, um, with Golden Gate Park having the least um, moisture levels and Mariposa Park having the highest moisture levels. Um, so though I did take moisture levels and perform statistical analyses on them, this data cannot stand alone as a measure of soil quality, but can give some insight into the ability of the soil to retain moisture. Um, so I did attempt to control the weather conditions between sites, and I visited each site on a day with pretty average weather conditions, although it had rained the night before I visited each site. So as you can see, um, its moisture levels the next day were very, very different. And this kind of brought up a question about their texture that I'll describe in my discussion. Um, so I did find that um, though I originally hypothesized the data would show a depletion of nutrients in Golden Gate Park, my research did disprove this hypothesis. Um, the nutrient levels were the most stable and the most adequate in Golden Gate Park, while at Tank Hill Park, um, many nutrients were abnormally low and deficient, um, and at Mariposa Park, oh, sorry, at Tank Hill Park, um, many nutrients were abnormally high, and in Mariposa Park, many were fairly deficient. Um, I found that the pH level levels remained fairly consistent, um, and throughout my research, I did conclude that microclimates do affect soil quality in San Francisco, though not the way I originally expected. Um, and I did conclude and I did find that soil is very, very heterogeneous and there's a lot of variation and a lot of factors that do affect soil quality, even just between replicates, um, just a couple feet away can have different conditions. Um, so this is called a soil texture triangle and it shows the breakdown in texture of soil at each location. And so I talked about moisture earlier, and I just wanted to bring this up again. So um, moisture data cannot stand alone as a measure of soil quality, but it did raise the question about soil texture and how it was different between the sites. Um, so soil texture is measured based on the breakdown of clay, silt, and sand. And I was able to determine the soil texture breakdown of each replicate by mixing the soil with water and letting it settle. I compared the percentage breakdown of each element um, to the soil texture triangle graph that you can see and identified its classification based on this. Um, so the soil textures are each um, pretty different, giving some insight into why the moisture levels for Golden Gate Park were so low. As you can see, it's the most sandy of, um, of, um, of each of my replicates and um, water does tend to leach out of sand pretty fast. 
Um, so that kind of gave me a little insight into why the moisture levels were so low, even though it had rained the day before um, and even the day that I visited the park. Um, so I'm not quite sure why Golden Gate Park had the most stable nutrient levels because there are just so many factors that do affect soil. Um, so I would like to study soil further and kind of um, a couple of different things I would like to study further are more microclimates in San Francisco to understand the exact effects of smaller microclimates. I would also really like to visit each location multiple times to determine how much weather affects soil um, versus climate. And then it would also be really interesting to test and sample natural areas rather than urban areas and see if there are any differences in that. And then I would really also like to test how microclimates affect soil quality across other regions other than just San Francisco. Okay, um, thank you so much. Great job, Vivian. While we wait for a question to come in, I guess, um, you collected a lot of different data for your project, right? Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about some of the other um, data that you didn't talk about here, like some of your observational data that you collected and what you yeah. might be able to um, learn from that? Um, so in each of the quadrats that I collected, I took a picture um, of, of the square um, that I looked at. And I kind of also wrote down um, what percentage was covered by um, vegetation, and I also looked at erosion, um, any signs of erosion that I could look at on the surface. And um, I tried to test different um, sites that had pretty similar maintenance levels. So even though um, even though Mariposa Park was a bit more maintained, I tried to test soil that looked a little bit more um, untouched, if that makes sense. Um, and so I did, I did see um, kind of similar, uh, similar vegetation coverage in the, um, in each of the sites. Um, and I saw, I saw some disturbances, but I, I kind of didn't think it was um, enough data to kind of test whether the soil quality was good or not. So I didn't include that in the presentation, but I, I did have some data on that. Great. Okay, and we have a question from Michelle, and she's asking, um, do you think that different weather on a different day in the same location could affect your results? Um, so I'm not sure how much it would affect my results. I don't think it would be like too different um, based on weather, but it was really interesting to see how the rain affected um, moisture levels and how fast, um, how fast water um, went out of Golden Gate Park soil. Um, just probably based on the texture, um, because even when we were there um, collecting data, it was slightly drizzling, although that soil was the driest that I did test. Um, so I do, I don't necessarily think that different weather would um, affect the results, but it would be really interesting to go back maybe um, like between weeks and kind of um, see just like the small differences. And another question from Jennifer. Um, how do you think ver various factors of soil quality, like nutrients, would differ across an urban gradient to bigger cities compared to natural forests? Um, I think that testing in a big city definitely has its implications. Like, there's going to be a lot of people walking on that soil, and um, and I'm not sure how that affected it, um, but it would be really interesting to see if maybe disturbances from just people walking all over it um, kind of affected nutrients or their concentrations in any way. And um, maybe testing soil quality in a more natural forest would have just a bit less disturbance, if that makes sense. And kind of seeing how, um, how the nutrient levels would um, react in a less disturbed area. Great. Well, good job, Vivian.
Oh, Thanks. another question. Never mind. <laughs> We're still going. Joel has a question. Um, he's curious what other factors, if any, beyond geography might have impacted the, your results. Um, I think there's a lot of um, factors that affect soil quality um, just by nature. Um, soil is really, really affected by climate, but also affected by other natural sources um, and human sources. So um, such as like people fertilizing and um, also just the presence of any vegetation or animals in those areas. The list goes on um, to what affects soil quality and my results. And I think that definitely having a larger sample size, I mean, that would have been pretty difficult, but would have um, been really interesting. Okay, great, good job. Um. Hi, Tilden. Hi, Tilden. Hi. Um, so next. So next. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going yeah, to introduce you introduce real quick. quick. Introduce you real quick. Um, so next we have um, Tilden Stad Miller from the Bay School of San Francisco. Um, Tilden did a really great job setting up his controlled experiment and isolating variables to understand how acidity in soil affects nutrients. Um, I really like Tilden's project because it's a topic that's really near and dear to me. Um, I worked in abandoned my land remediation and restoration in Colorado. And so it was really interesting to do this type of controlled study that can help kind of define boundary conditions that can be used to inform these types of remediation efforts. And so I will let Tilden get started. Tilden get started. Hi. All right, there we go. Um, so I'm doing my presentation, as you just heard, on the effects of uh, soil pH on nutrients. And so um, just to kind of start us off, what is pH? Um, pH is a unit of measure for determining how acidic or basic a solution is. It ranges on a scale from 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral. Um, so to the right of the slide, you can see a little pH test that I was doing on my soil. Um, yeah. So um, for my research project, um, I'm lowering the pH of soil to see how it affects the nutrients in the soil, as well as the quality of life for any plants in the soil. Um, this is something I've always wondered about since I learned about acid rain and how pollution affects um, the, the pH of rainwater in science class. And this also has a lot of other real world applications like understanding acid mine drainage. Um, Acid mine drainage is caused when water comes in contact with chemicals in mine shafts. It produces a very acidic liquid that seeps into the surrounding soil. Um, my controlled experiment helps me understand how this drainage affects the nutrient levels of soil. And um, this understanding of acid mine drainage and overall understanding of how acids affect nutrient availability can help prevent the loss of plant life. So my research question again is what does soil, what effect does soil pH have on the nutrients in soil and subsequently the plant life in the soil? Um, my independent variable is pH and my dependent variable is nutrient, nutrient availability. Um, I hypothesize that as the pH gets more acidic, the amount of nutrients in the soil will decrease. I think this is because plants can't live in low or high pH and lack of nutrients could be a possibility as to why. Um, so for my materials, I have a um, bag of potting soil, cups, a pH meter, a soil nutrient test kit, um, aluminum sulfate, and this is what I use to um, lower the pH of the soil. I would mix it in with water and then add that water to the soil. Um, distilled water, I thought I should use distilled water to um, mitigate any uh, nutrients or chemicals that might come in through tap water and, you know, just kind of playing it safe. Um, so for my method, I first filled two cups with soil and I measured the pH and nutrients of both cups. Um, I set one aside to be the control plot and I set the other side to be the test plot. Um, I added two tablespoons of distilled water to the control plot 
and two tablespoons of distilled water with one eighth of a teaspoon of aluminum sulfate to the test plot. I repeated this process about um, every two days and I measured the nutrients after two weeks and compared the results from before and the results from after. And so this brings us into the results. Um, these are the results for the phosphorus test I did. Uh, the graph on the left shows the average levels of pH, which is in blue, and um, phosphorus, which is in red. Um, so it's the, um, you can see, uh, sorry, um, you can see, I lost my place in my speaker notes, I'm very sorry. Uh, before the aluminum sulfate treatment and after 14 days of the treatment. The y-axis shows the nutrient levels on a scale of 0 to 7, 0 being depleted and 7 being a surplus. The average treatment levels before the experiment were about 3, and after the treatment they decreased to about 1. The graph to the right shows the control plots, and you can see that both the pH and phosphorus levels decreased slightly in the control over the 14 days, but not as much as in the treatment. Um, so here are the results for the potassium. These graphs are more or less the same, but again, the graph on the left shows that before the potassium values were around 3, but afterwards they fell to about 1. For the control group on the right, the potassium values, as well as the pH, naturally fell a little bit, but not as severely as in the test group. And so, the only differences between the control plots and the test plot is the independent variable, which is the pH. So therefore, it's safe to say the pH has an effect on the nutrients in the soil. Um, the test plot's pH, as well as the level of nutrients, go down substantially more than the control plots as well. The lowering in pH for the control plots could be attributed to the sunlight changing the pH, or possibly some other unknown factor that I did not account for. Um, lowering of the amount of nutrients being attributed to an outside source is unlikely, because of how controlled the experiment was, but it can't be ruled out. Um, and this data overall proves my hypothesis that as the pH of soil is decreased, the nutrient availability goes down with it. Um, these findings overall are helpful for understanding how damaging acid mine drainage is. Um, and that acid mine drainage can have a pH significantly lower than the ones I tested at, which can be far more detrimental to the land. Um, for future research, I would like to run a test with more replicants because more data is always better, as well as finding a better and more detailed way to measure the nutrients and the pH of the soil. And that's all I have for today. Thank you. Great job, Tilden. Great job, Tilden. Perfect. Well, we're waiting. Well, we're waiting. Um, you weren't surprised by, we're surprised by your result. Um, but what would you do, I guess, um, for another experiment besides doing more replicates? Like, would you be interested in looking, like, what other pHs would you be interested in looking at? Um, well, I would like to see how um, a basic solution affects the pH or the uh, level of nutrients in the soil, because that's not something I looked into in my study. So I think that would be interesting to see. Okay. Um, um, we don't have any questions. Any questions? Um, is there anything else that you want to um, From Willow, do you think that climate would impact your results? That I think it might. I think um, you know there is a possibility that it could affect my results. I cannot see. I can't think of any way that it would directly impact my results. Um, I think maybe in a hotter climate, there would be less moisture in the soil or the um, water would evaporate out of the soil faster, maybe leaving behind more um, 
more like acidic material, like um, sulfur from the acid mine drainage. But other than that, I cannot think of anything now. I think Willow we'll kind of had a follow-up. Kind of follow like maybe maybe um, you could, for another control experiment, you could control the temperature of the of your experiments and do this under specific, like, um, either colder or warmer conditions. Yeah. Okay, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Awesome. Awesome. Well, great job. Well, great job. And next up, we have Aiden. Hi, Aiden. Um, so Aiden is from the College Preparatory School in Orinda. Um, Aiden really likes to golf. And so what I really liked about Aiden's project is that he found a way to um, combine something he enjoys doing with work. And so he was able to combine collecting his field data with golfing on the weekends. Um, and I know firsthand that being a field scientist can be really hard sometimes. And so um, the days when I've been able to ski and do a site or hike somewhere really beautiful to collect my data, those have always been the days um, that I remember why I do what I do and I feel really lucky to be doing it. Um, so I was really happy that he was able to combine science with something he enjoys. Um, and he ended up with a really great, great project with really interesting and impactful results. And so Aiden, I'll let you get started. All right, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Aiden. Um, as Carrie said, I live in Orenda and I'm a sophomore at College Prep in Oakland. Um, so today uh, I will be presenting research I conducted on the environmental impact um, of golf courses on uh, surface water quality. So um, as Carrie said, I've golfed my whole life and it's my favorite sport and sort of my uh, main extracurricular activity. Um, but it wasn't until relatively recently that I became aware of the many environmental impacts that golf courses have. So when presented with the opportunity to conduct a research project, um, I decided to explore a little bit and look into the uh, environmental impacts of golf courses. Um, so to maintain their pristine look, uh, golf courses often opt to use excessive amounts of fertilizers. Um, to start with, fertilizers are just basically, um, they provide crops and plants with large amounts of food and nutrients um, to grow faster than they otherwise would in a natural environment. Uh, two of the most abundant nutrients within fertilizers are phosphorus and nitrate, which often enter lakes and streams via soil erosion and excess water runoff. Um, specifically, I will be focusing on nitrate um, as an indicator to determine the presence of fertilizers in bodies of water. Uh, runoff is a problem especially relevant to golf courses due to the large amount of irrigation uh, used to keep grasses green throughout all seasons. Um, this runoff uh, transports dissolved fertilizer nutrients into lakes and streams. Um, likewise, soil erosion carries fine particles um, enriched with nitrate into the same lakes and streams. And over time, um, these particles accumulate as sediment in the water um, and serve as long-lasting and hard-to-dispel sources of nutrients for aquatic plants. Um, once these nutrients are released into the water, um, aquatic plant organisms, such as algae, will react to the chemicals in a similar manner and a similar in a similar manner um, to any other sort of terrestrial crop. So this leads to, um, as we learned, I believe, from Ali's presentation, um, algae blooms, uh, which refer to the rapid accumulation of algae and marine water systems. Um, these blooms are very unhealthy for water ecosystems. Um, given that as algae decomposes, it removes substan substantial amounts of oxygen from the water. Um, this leads to eutroph eutrophication, uh, which is a term used to describe the process by which a body of water overabundant in plant species um, and is therefore too low in oxygen content. Um, eventually, this process can ultimately lead to the suffocation, suffocation um, of fish or other aquatic animal species um, as oxygen depletes entirely. Um, in addition to oxygen, oxygen depletion, um, there is the potential for aquatic algae to be toxic to humans um, or other animals. Certain algaes can cause respiratory problems, rashes, nausea, or even death for certain animals if consumed. Um, so definitely this is um, a very big problem and can golf courses using ex excessive fertilizer can have uh, wide environmental impacts on the overall aquatic ecosystem. Um, additionally, to be clear, EPA guidelines suggest that drinking water should contain no more than 10 particles per million 
um, though the manufacturer of the testing strips that I use state that any levels below 80 ppm are deemed safe for wildlife. Um, so that will be the sort of standard I use to determine what we consider safe, safe and unsafe. Um, so to move on to my Okay, there we go, sorry. So to move on to my research question, uh, which is what impact do golf courses have on the pollution of bodies of water caused by the contamination of fertilizers? Uh, my hypothesis was that bodies of water located within the premises of golf courses uh, will contain higher nitrate levels than similar bodies of water in natural or residential areas. Um, so my independent variable would be the location um, and my dependent variable would be nitrate levels. Uh, so, so to move on to my method section, um, I chose three golf courses with accessible water features that are also close to nearby natural or residential lakes. Um, at the golf course and at each of the nearby bodies of water, I took 10 replicates from all possible banks of the uh, wa uh, body of water. So I tried to get to as many of po as possible. Um, I, I got to uh, basically all that were accessible at the various lakes that I visited. Um, and after conducting my field tests, I plugged my data into graphing programs um, for further analysis. Um, so basically, I only had two really two main materials, which were my which was the uh, Tetra water quality testing kit that I used, and uh, the water from the uh, six independent sites that I visited. So uh, to move on to my results, I basically have this uh, graph as sort of a way of summarizing the main results that I found. Um, nitrate levels at Richmond Country Club, which was the first golf course I visited, uh, ranged from 180 to 200 particles per million, um, with an average of 198, uh, while nitrate levels at the nearby natural area ranged from about 20 to 160, with an average of 122. So both of which uh, were over the same amount of 80, um, though obviously the golf course had much higher levels. Um, likewise, Nitrate levels at Tilden Golf Course range from 40 to 160 particles per million, with an average of 120, um, whereas nitrate levels at the nearby natural area range from about 20 to 160, with an average of 76. So same thing as Richmond, um, in a way. Um, the golf course had far higher nitrate levels than the natural area, though actually the natural area at this point did have slightly lower um, than the safe required amount. So the natural area was deemed safe. Um, and then for my last uh, pair of sites um, at Karika Golf Course, uh, the nitrate levels ranged from 40 to 160 particles per million with an average of 92, um, whereas uh, nitrate levels at the nearby natural area ranged from 20 to 80 ppm um, with an average of 46. Um, here again at Karika, it was above the uh, safe limit, whereas the natural area was actually far below. Um, and there is certainly a very big difference there. Um, so in my discussion section, I concluded that uh, there was um, the golf courses tested did display uh, statistically significant um, higher levels of nitrate than their natural counterparts. Um, some possible sources of error include um, a lack of equipment accuracy. Um, for the Richmond Country uh, Club site, the nitrate levels actually exceeded the range that I was given, and it's just a testing strip. Um, so I wasn't actually given the exact value. I just knew that it was higher than the range that I was provided. Um, so for all I know, it could be um, really, it could be uh, 198 plus or 200 plus. Um, additionally, um, the values, oh yeah. So as I said, the values for individual, individual golf courses um, at Richmond went beyond the maximum value. Um, to continue uh, to my future research se section, um, I think it would be interesting to see if certain uh, fertilizer brands that golf courses utilize lead to higher nitrate levels than others. Um, so it would be nice to see maybe there's a certain brand that would work better than others um, and that would be more environmentally conscious. Um, it would also be interesting to see the impact um, on golf courses that are uh, located adjacent to freshwater um, versus saltwater. See if there would be um, a similar trend as I observed. All of my sites were freshwater. Um, additionally, my research was quite small. It was just three pairs of sites. So I think it would be interesting to see um, more comprehensive testing nationally or worldwide to see if 
um, if there's a broader trend there. Um, and I think it would also be very beneficial for golf courses to have detailed guidelines so that they know how they can be um, more environmentally conscious. Um, because right now I'm not entirely sure if there's a ton of research or a ton of pressure to actually meet safe guidelines. Um, and that's it, thank you. Great job, Aiden. A question from Malia. Why did you choose to do 10 replicates? Um, yeah, so I guess that was just the re uh, recommended uh, number so that I could get um, uh, a wide enough array of samples. Um, I guess it's sort of a reasonability thing, but I, I, I guess I thought that uh, 10 replicates would be a decent um, test of the water quality at the Gulf. And another question, We were any of the sites connected to other water bodies, such as inlets or outlets? And if so, how do you think that impacts your results? Um, yes, I, I believe uh, a few may have been. Uh, oh, in general, I tried to pick um, golf courses, or I tried to make sure that the bodies of water were of about the same size. Um, and I made sure my, uh, I took, I conducted my tests at about the same time of day. Um, it, it's possible that um, I guess other bodies of water connecting to it could have impacted the results. I definitely did make sure that um, there wasn't any sort of outside possible factors. So I tried to make sure that, you know, none of the golf courses were close to some sort of um, plant, for example, that could be uh, a contributing pollution factor. Um, yeah, just like I think a lot like on your golf courses, they were mostly ponds. And then in the natural yeah. area, some of them were like, were they also ponds or wetlands or streams? Um, they were they were all ponds. They were they all, were all essentially okay. sort of ponds related. Okay. Great. Well, good job. Great talk and really interesting results. Thank you very much, Aiden. And thank you so much, Carrie. We're gonna finish up the evening. I just wanna thank all the students who presented tonight. Every time you do something like this, there's always technology issues that come up. So Daniel, Leo, Ali, Vivian, Tilden, and Aiden, you all did fantastic. We're so proud of you. Thank you again to the mentors for being here. And audience, if you're watching and you wanna leave any more questions on our Facebook or our YouTube wall, we'll get those over to the students. And then please check us out on Thursday for another exciting round of more student presentations at 5.30 again. And we'll see you next time. Have a good night.